Okay, <laughs> so this is part two of um, a short commentary on the play of thought by KJ Dujan and Bechet. Um, I'll do a little bit of a recap for those of you who either weren't here last time or haven't seen the recording. Um, last time we discussed the fact that this is a pithy instruction related to the Zogchen Semja tradition. And um, I pointed out that we know that because Deuteronomy uses the word nepa or nepa, which is specific to the Semle teachings, specifically the four yogas, the four samadhis of the Zogchen Semle cycle. So um, commonly they're known as the four yogas. Um, but remember, we talked a while ago about this word yogas and what it means. So in this context, the word yoga, it doesn't mean a sort of outer practice that has to be done. It means union. So when we say the four yogas, another kind of way to say that is the four samadhis, or the four deepenings, I suppose, is another way you could say it as well. So the first part of the fifth instruction um, from Kem J. Dujan Rinpoche, which is called the play of thought, emphasizes the importance of mastering the mind, the Dharma practice. And it highlights that all experiences of suffering and all experience of happiness arise from our actions, which are driven by our motivations. And we discuss the fact that the only, the only valid motivations for practicing Dharma are the liberation from suffering and awakening for the benefit of oneself and others, all others. And in that teaching, Play of Thought, Rinpoche pointed out the interconnected nature of beings by saying that harming others ultimately harms ourselves because it obstructs our liberation. So in the first few stanzas of the play of thought, Rinpoche, and we discussed this last time, outlines the nature of thoughts which arise in endless chains, words he uses, deceiving us unless we break the cycle by allowing thoughts to dissolve naturally. And to achieve that, a foundation of tranquility and spaciousness in the mind is necessary, enabling thoughts to dissipate without identifying with them. And Rimshe provides meditation instructions, very concise meditation instructions, focusing on remaining relaxed, silent, and attentive without following thoughts, without too tight, fixed concentration either. So I remember we talked about last time when the mind rests in a state of tranquility akin to an ocean without waves. These are the words that Dujan Rimshe used. It, um, the mind enters the state known as nepa or abiding. In that state, little thought occurs and the mind experiences peace and contentment. However, external triggers can still cause thoughts and everything um, thought, impression, sensation, etc., are what is called in the context of these teachings, the four yogas or the four samadhis. It's all called movement. And then Dujan Rinpoche emphasizes that instead of resisting those movements, we can recognize them and return to the tranquility of an emperor while allowing the thoughts to dissolve by themselves. And um, if you remember last time I talked at length about um, Allowing thought to dissolve by itself doesn't mean um, that whatever arises in the mind is fine and okay. It means uh, actually that we, whenever there's movement, whenever anything rises in the mind, we reconnect with that stillness and that tranquility, and then that spaciousness allows that to dissolve by itself. And in time, that becomes natural. You don't need to kind of direct oneself towards any particular thing. If there is already just tranquility and spaciousness, and so whatever rises, it just dissolves naturally. So, and also in the teaching in that in those first stanzas that we covered last time, Dujan Rinpoche um, talked about um, uh, using awareness or ripa to allow the mind to return to tranquility whenever it's deserved. And he underscored that tranquility achieved through shamatha or shinain Tibetan is essential for Zogchen practice. 
which you might not hear in many of the online Dzogchen communities, but it is actually a fact. Shamatha is essential. And without that foundation of shamatha or spaciousness or tranquility, um, we risk being swept away by thoughts and the delusion of self and whatever else arises um, that obstructs the path to clarity and realisation. So in the next part of the commentary, um, which is the last few stances, I'll give, um, before I go to that, I'll give a brief description of the four uh, yogas or samadhis of Sokjin Semde, <clears throat> and then um, cover um, the remaining part of the pit instruction from Dujo Rinpoche. And um, we'll also at the end cover how to practice the first two yogas. We won't do the second two. Um, do that at another time because uh, this teaching really doesn't go there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me for a minute. Hmm. Okay, so the four yogas were some muddies. I'll give you the words that I use myself and I'll also give you the Tibetan words. There are Sanskrit words as well, but they're rather unworldly. Um, so I won't give you those ones, but they're easy to look up. So the first one is called Nepa in Tibetan, which is translates as tranquility or calm contentment or calm tranquility or abiding in peace. It's translated a number of different ways. The second one is called Migyopa. Um, I may not be pronouncing that exactly right, which I um, refer to as stillness. It's also called um, non-movement, immovability, etc. A, a number of different words. And the final one is presence, which is sometimes called spontaneous presence. The Tibetan word for that is lundrup, which you should be familiar with from um, lots of uh, teachings in Dhamma. Use that idea of spontaneous presence, or lundrup. So the first one, which is pronounced nepa, um, or tranquility. It um, means both abiding or dwelling in a particular state of mind. And it specifically refers to a settled, calm abiding where the mind remains steady and um, undisturbed by whatever's happening around the outer world and in the inner world. And in Solchen teachings in particular, it describes the act of resting or remaining in a state of calm awareness. So um, in terms of these four yogas or four samadhis, nepa, nepa or tranquility is a state of peaceful calm in which awareness is largely untroubled by negative emotions or too much thought. It's fairly simple. It's very, very much um, equivalent to calm abiding. And it is achieved through shamatha. The second one, Migyoba, translates to immovable, still, unshakable, or unwavering. And I just call that stillness. In the context of Dzogchen, it carries a profound meaning related to the nature of mind and the state of realization. In the Dzogchen teachings, Migyoba refers to the unshakable and stable nature of mind in its natural state, um, which is free from distraction, dualist thinking, and disturbances. And when a practitioner realizes the true nature of mind, they experience this immovable state. Um, sometimes called the Vajra state, um, which is characterized by stability, unwavering presence, um, and um, uh, an unshakable luminous, luminosity or luminous awareness. So whatever happens, whatever moves in the mind, that uh, luminous uh, clarity remains undisturbed. <laughs> So um, Migyoba or stillness is a state of unshakable quiet in which awareness is able to recognize both stillness and the movement of thought. So um, this is why it's kind of um, uh, aligned with Vipassana. Using Vipassana, we have insight into the still nature of the mind, also the movement of thought, and also the nature of awareness itself. And so that's um, an essential part of uh, 
of the deepening of a meditation practice. But in this state of Migyoba, um, or the experience of Migyoba rather than state, um, there's still a subtle sense of self and other. So that is still there. Likewise, still there in Nepa. Um, that's kind of the distinguished feature of the next one, which is called Namni, um, which can be translated as equality, equanimity, or non-duality. So in the Zogjian teachings, that relates to the equal um, or, or the intrinsic equality or sameness of all things, the innate perfection of all things. And it's um, unpleasant or pleasant, good or bad. Um, everything has the same essence um, and there's no distinction necessarily between these dualistic concepts of good and bad, um, right and wrong, uh, perfect and imperfect, pure and impure, etc. So Nyamni represents the realisation that all phenomena are inherently equal in their nature, free from dualistic distinctions. So it's a direct experience of the non-dual nature of mind. Um, it's not a conceptual understanding of equality or equanimity it's a direct experience that goes beyond words, beyond language. So namni or non-duality is a state in which there is no thought or movement at all. So there's no thought at all in which there is um, there's just non-dual awareness in which self and other has dissolved completely. So this is a fairly deep state or deep experience. Um, I'm going to talk about this um, uh this non-thought thing a bit more later because it's kind of important. There's a lot of misinformation out there about non-thought in certain Zogchen circles. And by Zogchen circles, I mean people talking about Zogchen online who aren't necessarily qualified to do so. And then finally, the fourth yoga or the fourth samadhi is Lundrup, which translates as spontaneous present, but also sometimes translated as natural perfection. That's slightly right. different. And sometimes translated as self-arising, which is interesting. So it's the idea that the mind and reality are inherently perfect and manifest spontaneously without effort um, or contrivance. So in the context of Zogchen and other advanced practices, Lundrup describes a state in which all phenomena naturally arise from the intrinsic nature of mind without any need for intentional creation or manipulation. Um, so Lundrup or presence is a self-perfected state of total equanimity in which abiding in tranquility, stillness, and non-duality is permanent. So that's the distinguishing feature of Lundrup. So um, in Nepa and well, in, in tranquility and in stillness, um, there's still a sense of self and there's still some movement in the mind. In Nyamni, there's no movement any longer, but there's still a sense of being a, a person, a sense of self. In Lundrup, that is gone. Sense of self is gone, and um, essentially, it's um, uh, you know, I mean, lots of lamas have said that that state's equivalent to being a Buddha. So um, that's a kind of brief um, definition of those four yogas. Um, I'm going to talk about something a little bit later. It's really important because when we remember that um, this word yoga it doesn't mean like a set of postures or stuff to do. In this context, it means union in this context. So these four yogas or four samadhis are actually not four different practices. They're about four deepenings of experience toward a natural condition. Now, to encourage that deepening, there is some sort of meditation posture that's encouraged and there is some slight changes between the first one and the second one, but they're in no means um, compulsory at all, and there's quite a lot of um, differences from lineage to lineage about how these things are approached. Apples and oranges, there's no good or bad in this sense, they're all just different. All right, so we'll go back now to Dujum and Shay's The Play of Thought, we'll pick up where we left off last time. I just wanted to give you those um, sort of definitions of the four yogas, um, because this teaching is about that, although it hides it. Um, you know, and it sort of reveals itself as a teaching about the four yogas through the use of that one word, nepa. Okay, 
So Dujo Rinpoche writes, at present, the thoughts which assail us are so present, so persistent, that we feel obliged to follow them. The practice of mental calm wears away the aggressiveness of thoughts so that it is progressively easier for us not to depart, depart, depart from serenity. By getting used to that, we shall be so relaxed in meditation that the desire to move will disappear. A great sense of well-being will invade us and we shall desire never to leave that state. So that sounds pretty good. <laughs> it sounds really very appealing, in fact. So, just a minute, if you people are running a little late. So, um, in that stanza, Dijon Rishi is referring to the common experience of being overwhelmed by persistent thoughts, obviously. And he suggests that through regular practice of mental calm or shamatha, um, that's, which is just simple silent sitting, the intensity and aggressiveness of these thoughts gradually diminish. It's interesting to use that word, aggressiveness, because they do have that quality. Um, and as we continue to practice, it becomes easier to stay serene and not be carried away right. by the thoughts that arise or the impressions that arise or the sensations that arise. And obviously, you'll all be well aware that in the context of the doctrine, a central principle is to remain effortlessly relaxed and to rest in a state of ease or contentment. And the idea is that you become more accustomed to that relaxed state and then the urge to react or move diminishes. So whatever rises in the mind, it no longer compels a reaction. And when it doesn't compel a reaction, it just dissolves because it is in its nature, empty, and it will dissolve without us interfering with it. So, um, you know, through shamatha, calm abiding or sitting meditation, we cultivate this effortless, relaxed awareness where we're content just to be without feeling the need to chase after or resist the flow of thought. So whatever rises is okay, we're fine with it. And that's obviously um, a state of quite deep peace and well-being where we're okay with how we are, we're okay with whatever arises because we know it's just going to dissipate of its own accord. We just remain resting in this peaceful state or tranquility. So um, I think sometimes um, people struggle to establish a, you know, a consistent meditation routine because in some way they see it as hard or difficult or something. But if we can, you can see here, like Dujan Rinpoche is talking about the benefits of doing so. And it's this very deep, intrinsic sense of well-being so it's not based on anything external and this very deep calm and contentment where we just we don't want to do anything else we're just happy to just be in that state so if we um are struggling to adopt a consistent practice routine like every day then it's important to remember that that the benefits are actually quite profound and um, the benefits are both spiritual and also about our mental health and our physical well-being. Because when we're more calm and more relaxed, our mental health improves and our physical health improves. So there's like a 360-degree benefit here to adopting a regular practice. And I think um, if we're not doing that, um, it's really important that we ask why. So often when we're not practicing regularly, we just let it slide, let it slide, let it slide. Oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, I'll do it next week. I'm busy. We give ourselves excuses and, um, uh, you know, just keep going as we have been going. But it's really important if we're not practicing every single day to stop, and maybe even do some journaling and ask ourselves, okay, why? What is the reason? Why am I not doing this the, there's usually two reasons that are um not necessarily obvious to us and they are we haven't taken impermanence to heart so we think there'll always be another day to do it this is not true we may not have a tomorrow so we need to practice today and the other is 
that we don't truly, um, well, there's probably another two. We don't truly understand the benefits. And so that's why this teaching by Dujan Raja is really kind of important, as we were saying. There are health benefits, there are well-being benefits, there are spiritual benefits. It's 360 degrees of benefit. You know, there's absolutely no reason why you wouldn't want those benefits. So that so you know, we need to do the practice, quite simple. And then the other thing, the third thing, I remember, I remember I said there's two, but there is actually three. The third one is that we do not have confidence in our own ability. So we think, oh, no matter how much I practice, I'll always be the same. I'll always be this broken, tainted, tarnished, worthless being. So what's the point? You know, I'll always be like this. So what's the point? That is fundamental delusion. And that is part of the um, illusion that the dualistic mind uses to keep us trapped so the dualistic mind can continue to survive. Because, you know, when we talk about survival instinct, the dualistic mind is what has that survival instinct, you know. It has a profound survival instinct. It wants to survive. And so anything that might lead to its dissolution, such as this, it will undermine in whatever way it can. It usually does that by distracting us. So, you know, movies, TV, um, boyfriends, girlfriends, puppies, kitty cats, um, bird watching, watching the Olympics, you know, whatever it is. It usually does it through distraction. So we're always chasing after stimulation and gratification. But it also does it by this very cruel undermining of our confidence. You can never achieve it. You'll always just be what you are now. Other people can achieve this, but you are not able to. It's very cruel self-hatred, you know, which often is undermining us. So I really think if you are not practicing every day, even if you have some significant challenges, as I repeat all the time, Jamyang has more challenges than I've ever encountered in any other person ever and yet practices every single day without fail even when he's in really quite severe pain practices you know so we don't really have an excuse i understand that some days it's impossible for everyone some days it's impossible but we should be able to practice most days if we're not talking about a lot of time here we want to start with half an hour an hour and grow from there, it's not a lot, you know, and we all spend much more than that listening to the radio, watching TV, scrolling on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, whatever else the other ones are. We all spend more than that on that stuff, talking to neighbours, talking to family. We all do more than an hour on all of those other things, you know, so we can find the time. We really can. Um, we just need to understand that it's super important. All right, um, I'll go back to my notes. So the next line in the teaching from Dujon Rinpoche, it's one line, I'm going to spend a little time talking about just this one line because it's actually really quite powerful. And Dujon Rinpoche says, even when practised in the dark, this is another clue that this is a Dzogchen teaching, this practice brings an experience of total clarity similar to a nascent dawn. So a nascent dawn is that moment um, just before the sun peaks up over the horizon. So you have light permeating the sky, but yet the sun is not um, there. So it's um, the light is fully permeating the environment rather than sort of localised. And the reason this is important is because a lot of Zogchen practice is undertaken in the dark. Um, Jamming meditates in the dark. She did so for very many years, and he alternates between darkness meditation and sky gazing, which is a very um, effective, profound, um, and quite ancient way of doing this, alternating between the two. Okay, so um, I just want to talk about this for a minute because it also um, there's some hidden things here. So on the literal level, okay, so when we're practicing in the dark, we experience luminosity, the luminosity of awareness. 
So this is this is um, metaphorical and literal. So on a metaphorical level, our mind um, experiences clarity. We have greater insight, um, and we have uh, more stable awareness. Right. That's kind of like the internal metaphorical um, thing about light. But also, there is actually actual light. So even though you're meditating in the dark, the dark fills with light as you deepen in your practice because the uh, luminous nature of things begins to shine through when the mind starts to quieten down. It literally, the luminous nature of all things, even the most dark shadow, begins to shine. Everything begins to shine. It's really quite amazing. All right, so that's just one line. I wanted to pull that out because I think it's really important to understand that this is both little, literal and metaphorical. There is literal luminosity when we practice in this way, and there is metaphorical luminosity, which is clarity of mind. Okay. So again, um, back to the teaching, Jujun Moshe writes, if we practice meditation, these three experiences, bliss, clarity, which is also called luminosity in some teachings, and the state of mind without thoughts will not fail to arise at some point. If that does not occur, it means that either we are not practicing correctly or that we have not trained enough. Now, I would... I'm not disagreeing with Deuteronomy Shea here at all. But I would say it's usually the second one. We have not trained enough. Um, there are some uh, meditation uh, fumbles that we can do. But this kind of sitting, just sitting in a relaxed way, um, awareness gently on breathing or on something that we're looking at with our eyes, allowing whatever rises in the mind to just rise and then just pass away of its own accord, there's very little that you can do wrong there. This is all very simple, you know. It's very profoundly simple. It's not like some of these kind of Vipassana traditions where, you you know, you have to do this body scan and make these statements about I am, I am sitting here with my awareness on my knee. You know, there's some very um, convoluted, Vipassana kind of practices. That's not at all what this is about. So in this, you know, Vipassana or insight into the nature of mind, it arises naturally from tranquility. So um, so it's usually the second one. We have not trained enough. And that's what I was just talking about. If we are not sitting for, you know, half an hour to an hour a day, we have to ask why. What? Why are we not? What? What is the problem? Why are we making that choice? Because it is a choice. All right. So that passage underscores the natural progression of meditation practice, where these three things, bliss, clarity, and non-thought, are expected to arise over time. And they're considered to be signs of effective practice. That being said, they're not the point. And we don't um, focus on trying to achieve them or hang on to them when they occur. Um, but if they don't arise, there's something happening. Now, not necessarily all of them will arise for everyone. Some people will not experience bliss, for example. That's, that's um, not universal. But clarity and non-thought, those are universal. Everyone should have that experience. Okay, so if they are not arising, we need to do a little reflection and ask, um, is there something I'm doing wrong? And the only really thing you could be doing wrong with this kind of meditation is to be uptight, to be trying, striving, wanting, um, forcing, forcing it. If you're relaxed and just sitting, it's literally just sitting. There's nothing else happening. You're just sitting, nothing else, um, then it should be okay. Your mind should settle and quiet, and then this luminous quality should emerge, and bliss might, and clarity and um, non thought certainly will. 
So we need to ask ourselves, are we practicing enough? It's a very important question. So um, as I pointed out, like that passage really shows that if these things, specifically clarity and non-thought, don't arise, it means that we need to um, have a look at our practice and reflect. So um, the passage is a reminder, a gentle one but a very clear and precise one, that sustained effort is required and proper guidance is important too, you know, in terms of doing it correctly. Um, proper guidance, sustained effort, these are essential. I want to talk about non-thought now a little bit more, as I said earlier, because um, in some of these Zogchen discussion forums online, which I think are, you know, poison, um, there's an idea circulating that Zogchen meditation doesn't involve non-thought, that, you know, we're all resting in awareness and whatever arises in awareness is fine and it's okay and we don't react to it, we just let it be, et cetera, et cetera. That's a profound mistake. It's a profound mistake. Rigpa is a state of total non-thought. That is unequivocally true. It's a mistake to think that if you're if there's still a, you know, a carnival of thinking happening, that you're resting in awareness. You're, you're not, we are not, that is not what's happening. We're resting in samsara is what we're doing. If that's if that if there's this parade of thought and emotions and sensations as well. So I just wanted to read a couple of, um, I could go, I could do this for four hours, literally pull out quotes from Zogchen masters about what Rupert is to prove my point. But I just picked out two because they're very clear and very um, short. But I just want to make this very clear, right? Intrinsic, this is from Nupchen Sangye Yeshi, very early Zogchen master, one of the early Turtons as well. Intrinsic awareness, aware of space, is free from thoughts, endowed with the force of abiding naturally. So he, um, in Tibetan, he's using the word napa there. It is without thoughts and occurs like the sky itself. Boundless, open, pervasive, you know. So that's the first one, Nupchen Sangye Yeshi. And I picked two that are sort of one that was ancient and one that was more contemporary. So the second one is from Tuku Ergin Rimshe. And he says, thinking only begins after marigpa, which is ignorance, sets in. At the loss of rigpa, this is very, I mean, this is very clear. Thinking is only there once one is not in rigpa. During the non-distraction, so that's a, a different kind of translation of the second um, Dzogchen yoga, the yoga of the same day or samadhi of the same day, um, stillness, during the non-destruction of Rigpa, no thought can begin. This is very clear. I cannot emphasize this enough, he says. There is no thought during the state of Rigpa. Okay, so these people who are saying, oh, you know, I, whatever rises in the mind, you know, I'm just letting it be there with awareness. It's all encompassed by awareness, etc., etc. I mean, these things are quite true, but that's profound delusion as well. It is delusion. It's a misinterpretation of the teachings. So something that is um, not widely known or not widely understood is that the Dzogchen texts have quite a lot of deliberate misdirection. They put things in a certain way that it's very easy to misunderstand, you know, because they want you to have a guide, a teacher and a guru, and they want um, you to practice correctly and consistently, you know, Persistently and consistently. So there's a lot of deliberate misdirection there in these teachings. And it's not, um, I would think, oh, that's like so mean. <laughs> but it actually is an act of compassion because what it does is it enables the teachers and the gurus to differentiate between um, three kinds of people. The first kind, person who is practicing correctly and is progressing and is having these experiences. And they say to their teacher or guru, this is what's happening. 
and the teacher or guru, if they're not a fully realized being, they they judge where that person is based on what they say. If the teacher or guru is a fully realized being, they can just see where that person is without any conversation, you know. But that kind of guru is very rare. So mostly they use this dialogue to determine what's happening. So that's number one. They go, oh yeah, this person is progressing. They can just continue to what they're doing. Then the second group of people breaks down into kind of two kind of camps. They are people who are who think they're progressing, um, but they're either uh, they've either fallen sway to suggestion, so they've read some sort of blockchain text, and they legitimately think that they are having that experience, you know, or they've fallen prey to self delusion, which is you know where you delude yourself into thinking that you're doing the practice. Um, because you actually are afraid of it or have some other reason not to really truly probably practice. So there's two two people in that second group. Those who've fallen to the, the who are victims of suggestion, those who are quite self-deluded. And those two people, um, you know, there's a way of dealing with that. It's to give them proper proper guidance, get them to practice properly and help them to understand they have not actually experiencing what they think they're experiencing. And the third group of people are the ones who need the most um, help and kindness and compassion. They're the ones who are actually uh, deliberately faking. You know, they're saying, I'm having this experience when they actually actually know that they are not. They've read the text and they're just saying that because they're faking. That group of people are almost always, um, you know, treated very kindly and sent back to redo the basics, you know, impermanence, um, renunciation, because anyone who feels the need to fake that clearly has no renunciation, clearly has very low self-esteem as well, and clearly needs support and assistance. But they also need to go back to the beginning. So I really just want to make this very clear. Um, this idea that resting in awareness means that whatever rises in the mind, you just, you know, trying not to react to it, that is not um, practice. That is just being an ordinary person and letting samsara run and being mildly aware of it, you know. Rigpa is a state of total non-thought. The goal of practice is to abide in Rigpa permanently. Okay? Tuga in another setting said, total non-thought is being a Buddha. So this idea that non-thought is a problem or something that, I mean, people do get attached to it, of course, but... Um, it is essential step, you know, without becoming attached to it, obviously. So now back to Dujan Rinpoche, he says, it could be that we experience a somber, heavy feeling during this practice, as if our head were covered by a hood. This resembles a state of boredom in which there are no thoughts. So this is where some of this confusion arises. If this state emerges, we should shake ourselves, sit up, imbue our heart with great intensity and look up rather than look down. So this shows us there's two kinds of non-thought. One is beneficial, the other is not. The kind of non-thought that is beneficial is a non-thought permeated by luminous awareness. The kind that's not beneficial is this dull, blank, not thinking, you know. It's like that state you're in just before you fall asleep, you know, when you're really tired and your mind just shuts down. So there's so this is where this confusion has arisen, I think. This kind of non-thought is a problem because it's a blank, dull state. But true non-thought is when the luminous awareness is all-pervasive and it's very clear and very enlivening and very rich, you know. This other state is like, you know, and even the body responds to it by sort of slumping a little bit, the head drops down a little bit, you know, um, this second kind of non-thought is in, you know, in Tibetan, there are different words for these two things, but in English we just have this one idea, non-thought, you know. So this non-thought is the one that's the problem that we need to be wary of. So, and the antidote to that dull blank mind is really very simple. Dijon Mishra says we should shake ourselves. So literally, do a little bit of a shake, sit up a bit more, imbue our heart with greater intensity. What does that mean? We'll get to that in a minute. 
and look up rather than down. So it means literally cast one's eyes a little higher. It's usually just a centimeter or so adjustment, but it, it can be quite powerful. And now we come to my favorite part of this whole teaching, which is pretty deep, even though it's only a couple of pages long, it's actually very deep. Um, and this, um, but this stanza, the final stanza is really my favorite of the whole thing. And it says, the best method for eliminating obstacles during meditation is that of devotion to the Lama. And by the Lama, they mean Guru. Thanks to this devotion, our mind becomes one with the mind of the Lama. It is not a matter of mixing one thing with another, but rather of pouring water into water. Just as the space enclosed by the hands becomes identical to the external space once the hands are parted, so also there is no difference between our mind and that of the Lama. His or hers is not better, ours is not impure. Such differences do not exist. This is really the secret of meditation. So when we're having trouble with our meditation, apart from, you know, when you have that dull blank thing, it's good to sort of enervate oneself and shake oneself and sit up and move and cast one's eyes up. But other than that, any other problem with meditation, which includes the problem of not even sitting down, not getting down on the cushion, that all of these problems are solved by devotion to the Lama. And when we say Lama here, we're not talking about, you know, anyone who has this title, we're talking about the guru, a person who is realized. So Shakyamuni Buddha, Mahaprajapati, um, who is the Buddha's uh, stepmother um, and aunt. Yeah, I'm going through the list slowly. <laughs> Pamisan Baba, it was Janang. Pamisan Baba, Yeshi Sogyo, right? Plus our lamas, Kyabje Jogjan Amtrin, Kyabje Dujan Rimshe, right? There's many others, obviously, but this is kind of the list that we use in this Sangha. Devotion to those beings is the answer to all obstacles to meditation practice because it innovates the heart relaxes the mind, illuminates the nature of the world and the nature of ourselves and inspires us to practice more. We have in this time a lot of resistance to guru yoga and devotion which I do understand, I've said so many times, I understand it, I get it. Um, there's a lot of dodgy so-called lamas out there. There's a lot of abuse. There's been a lot of um, unacceptable breach of the core ethical principles of the Dharma by people who are supposed to know better. And, and there's been a lot of abuse of students, completely unethical abuse of students. So I get it. I understand. Oh, people are afraid of that. But that's not what we're talking about. At first, and I've said this so many times, it feels like I am just an empty echo. At first, Guru Yoga is on the cushion. You know, you're visualizing a realized being. Shakyamuni, Mahajapadipadi, Papasambhava, Yeshi Sogyo, Togden Amtrun, Kyabja Jujan Rinpoche. You're visualizing these beings or just calling them to mind and you're becoming one with them. And that can be done via a kind of tantric method where you visualize them, they dissolve into your heart, you dissolve into space, etc. That's a kind of a tantric way of doing it. But it can simply be to abide in that feeling of love, trust, respect. Just be there with that state. Have them in mind, abide in that state of love, trust, and respect. That is Guru Yoga. You don't have to say any liturgy. You don't have to do any visualization necessarily. Some people might find that beneficial to do that. Some people don't need to. Some people even might find that to be an obstacle to them sitting in that state, you know. But the really important thing to understand is if 
we are not abiding in Brigpa, total non-thought, at will. So whenever we want to, you know, it's not stable. You know, a, a Buddha is stable abiding in Rigpa. A realized being is abiding in Rigpa when they choose, you know. If we're not abiding in Rigpa when we choose, we need outer Guru Yoga. This idea of, oh, you know, like secret Guru Yoga, inner Guru Yoga, that is not where we are yet if we are not able to abide in Rigpa at will. It's very simple. We need this outer thing because the mind is still profoundly dualistic. So we need something of a dualistic process to get it going. So the other thing is, if you start your meditation with devotion, if you you know you see any of the pithy instructions on Trekcha, Togyo, any of the Managday styles of Chen things, they often will start with Guru Yoga as the as the beginning of it. Also in Zogchen Sende, they might not like foreground that as like an essential component. That's because they assumed everybody understood, you know. So any kind of meditation practice that starts with Guru Yoga is going to be deeper. It's going to be more fun. It's going to be more um, likely to continue, encourage us to continue to see it more. So... And it's also a great um, response to if we haven't got a daily practice yet, if we're still being distracted and um, swept up in sansaric life, then devotion is a way through that. As one opens up more and more to love and affection for the Lama first and then for all sentient beings, the, the impulse to practice comes naturally. It becomes something that we wouldn't even question whether or not we're going to do it. It is so absolutely part of us. And that's the other thing, this water into water metaphor for devotion. This is very true. Our fundamental nature, Rigpa or Buddha nature, is the Buddha. It is Buddha mind. It is the same as the Guru. It is, of course. However, the the radiance of that, which is these these mind states of love, devotion, affection, trust, respect, they are they are non dual with that truth with Rupa Buddha nature. They arise from it. They're of the same taste. So to be in that state more readily allows the mind to relax and for that luminosity to shine. So we will take a five-minute break and then we'll come back and do a six-minute break and then we'll come back and do some questions and answers. Um, I just want to repeat so the secret of meditation, the last line that Dijon uses here, the secret of meditation is that devotion and the truth that our nature and the guru's nature are non-dual, inseparable, of the, completely of the same nature, but also completely inseparable. They can't be separated. So we'll do a six-minute break. So come back at, oh, well, you're all in different time zones, so come back in six minutes, eight o'clock my time, and then I'll really quickly go over how we practice Napa, how we practice Migyoba, or um, the first two yogas. It doesn't take long because it's very simple, and then we'll do a Q&A. All right? Thanks, everyone. I'll see you back in a few minutes. All right, so I just wanted to repeat what I just said then while the recording wasn't working, um, some tips that Jamyang Young gave. So he said, you know, there's a big difference between ordinary thought, ordinary non-thought, sorry, and abiding in Rigpa. Ordinary thought can be caused by, um, you know, dullness, imitation, obviously, trauma, shock, a number of other reasons. Um, And he also pointed out that as long as there is self, there is thought. As long as there is thought, there is self. So this 
state that we're talking about or this experience we're talking about, which happens in the later of the four um, yogas of Dzogchen Semde, it is something that requires kind of consistent practice and persistence. It's not going to come easily. And we also pointed out that chasing after non-thought is a really bad idea. Chasing after bliss, chasing after clarity, this is a bad idea. We simply do our practice and whatever happens, happens. But we see them as indications that we are practicing correctly and practicing consistently. But we don't chase and when they happen, we don't cling. Okay. And then we talked about if you can't do anything, if you can't sit down, if you can't do any kind of practice at all, just do Kuru Yoga. You can do the bare minimum. Lama, be with me now. Think of the Lama, Shakyamuni Buddha, Mahan Pajapati, Padmasabhava, Yashisokyo, Togjanamchun, Dujan Rinpoche. Just think of them, think of their positive qualities. Allow the respect and trust you have for them to deepen into devotion. And that is enough. Devotion is a complete path. It is enough. If you can't bring yourself to sit, that is enough. So it's a fail-safe method. All right. Now, I'm going to quickly cover how to practice the first two yogas. Um, those of you doing the five-year program will be aware that um, the way we teach meditation um, is already in alignment with um, the four yogas, and it's also in alignment with the Dzogchen Pith instructions of Kepja Chodan Amtrin and Kepja Dujan Rinpoche. So we're already doing this. There's nothing new to learn here, really. Over the years, we've been doing this, right? Or I'm hoping that you've been doing this. So how is napa or tranquility achieved? It's through the practice of shamatha, okay? And what is shamatha in this context? Because remember we talked about the last time that there's different approaches to shamatha. Shamatha in this context means to focus on the relaxed part, the calm part, right? To have one's awareness placed very gently on the object, which can be the breathing, but also can be um, something we're looking at with our eyes. Usually in this setting, the sky, but it can be an image of our teachers, an image of the Buddha, a flower, a crystal, a stone, a twig, anything really that doesn't trigger reactions. And that's it. Still silent. Remember earlier on we talked about um, in the first part of these commentaries um, and then in the recap I did here, Dujan Rinpoche gave these um, tips, you know, what does this shamatha look like when we're practising in this way? Relaxed. First word he used, relaxed. Second word, silent. Silent also means still. So do not move around too much. Also not do mantra, not do prayers, just be silent and still, and then attentive or aware without following thoughts. So not letting yourself get swept away. And if you are swept away, use very gently and in a relaxed kind of way, come back to your object, which is either your breathing or whatever your eyes are on. And again, when we're looking at something, we're using a relaxed gaze. So we're not staring. We're just, our eyes are just really relaxed and we're taking in the periphery as well. So we're not like zooming in. It's the whole visual um, field and we're just gently looking, gently gazing, not trying to make anything happen and just sitting. We're literally just sitting in a relaxed way. As I repeat over and over and again, our cat can do this. <laughs> it's not difficult. All right, so napa, tranquility, the first of the four yogas or samadhis or, you know, unions or deepenings, however you want to put that, is done simply through sitting, okay? In this lineage, um, sky gazing is an equivalent to shamatha. So you can do shamatha, you know, eyes closed, sitting, awareness on the breath. You can do shamatha sitting, eyes open on an object like a twig or a stone or a crystal or a flower or an image of a teacher or the Buddha, or you can do sky gazing, right? Th these are all fine. And then the second yoga, Migyoba, or Nikyuba, um, 
how is that achieved, which is stillness, you know, or non-movement. Remember, it also can be called non-movement. And that is through the practice of Vipassana. But Vipassana in this context doesn't mean what um, you might find like in the Goenka tradition or in the insight meditation tradition or in any number of other traditions. It is very different. So in this context, and this is rooted in the early sutras where the Buddha says quite clearly that Vipassana can be achieved through shamatha. They don't need to be separate practices. Insight can come through shamatha, and that's what we're doing here. So again, when you talk about the four yogas, that makes you think, oh, there's four different practices. But when we understand that yoga means union or deepening, right, then we know, oh, okay, this is a natural unfolding. We're sitting in shamatha. Insight naturally happens. Insight into what? insight into the nature of the mind. In this sense, we're talking about the dualistic mind that has two qualities, right? It has stillness. There's a stillness and spaciousness to the dualistic mind, and it has movement or thought that happens within that stillness. So that's still the dualistic mind, right? And stillness is, you know, if you're ever sitting like, um, on the shore of a lake, you know, it's very pristine and still. It's very quiet and calm. And then a leaf falls on the surface. You know, your awareness is instantly there because it is a change. You know, something has happened. There's a change. There's a ripple. You can see it, you know. So in this context, Vipassana or insight is the ability to distinguish between the two things, stillness and movement, right? With what? With one's awareness. You know, so awareness is able to distinguish these things. There's stillness in the dualistic mind, there's movement in the dualistic mind. You know, and why do we want that? Because once we have that, then the the, the microsecond before something rises, you know, we're able to already let it go. You know. There's a glimmer or something of something about to arise and we just let that go and it dissolves. Ultimately, in the state of, um, you know, non-duality or primordial presence, these later, later yogas, very little is rising at all and in the final one, in presence, which is total equanimity, which is Buddhahood, all that rises is radiance of the ultimate nature or radiance of Buddha nature or radiance of Rikpa. So it's always beneficial. So you don't need to, it doesn't need to be addressed. You know, it's always an impulse towards good, you know, or an impulse towards joy or an impulse towards love or an impulse towards mm -hmm. compassion or an impulse towards contentment. It's the radiance of the true nature. It's not a problem anymore, you know. So that's how we do it. We do this very simple practice. And naturally, these yogas unfold as we deepen. There is, between the first and second one, a little bit of a difference in some traditions. So in some traditions, in the first one, in, when you're cultivating nepa, or the first yoga, you, you are sitting with eyes closed. And often in that one, people are doing the corpse pose. So lying on the ground, eyes closed, you know. Um, and then in the second one, the eyes open, you know, that is in some lineages, but again, none of that is compulsory. However, you feel comfortable, as Guru Mshe says, whatever position feels best is best. So, whatever feels comfortable, that's what you do, you know, and it will naturally, if you're able to relax and feel comfortable, it will deepen, the practice will deepen of its own accord without us doing anything. And then, when experience of non thought arise, bliss, clarity, we simply are, allow them to happen and we don't clean, but we also don't try to force them or chase them. Really, um, you know, when you're going to sleep at night and in a teaching by Mipam Rinpoche about, you know, how to meditate, he says it's really okay to have that kind of feeling you have when you're going to bed. You know, you're just letting go and relaxing and there's nothing more to do and whatever's going on, just let it go and you're just getting comfortable and squeezing in and 
making sure you're all comfy and it's all pleasant and relaxing and nice. That is it. That is it, you know, but nothing more than that. So that's how you practice the first two yogas. All right. I'll just drop this here again at the end just so that we can really get this clear. As long as there is self, there is thought. As long as there is thought, there is self. These are synonyms. They're the same thing, right? And if you can't do anything, if you if your dualistic mind just resists everything, right, just do guru yoga. Just do that. And it doesn't matter how what shape it takes. Simple lama with me now, or you can do some kind of visualization of the guru, or you can, you know, you can sing devotional songs, or you can whatever you whatever you want in terms of your devotional practice is fine. And that is enough. That really is enough. All right. So we'll go on to questions. Um if you have questions, either put up your hand either at the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on what kind of device you have, there's a little raise hand icon. You pop that up and I'll um, answer questions. I am recording this, so if you don't want to have your voice or image recorded, then um, put the question through in the chat. All right. It usually takes people a little while to come up with questions um i have a question but i can't find the icon to raise my hand that's okay go ahead amelia <laughs> um just with the you know non-thought and self um say when like you're at work and you know like you're busy in like projects and things like that um how does does that eventually is there a state of being where you are in the world you know fulfilling your responsibilities and things like that where you can also reach that state or is that just reserved for people who um, have the capacity to not be in the world as such. Okay, so something that Jamming said just moments ago was that Buddhas abide. He said something a little controversial, which I'm going to repeat. The Buddha doesn't have a mind. A Buddha doesn't have a mind because thought, self, and mind are synonyms. The Buddha is without mind. The Buddha is just awareness, right? Which you could call absolute mind or whatever you want to do. But so the Buddha, right, definitely related to people, sometimes very challenging situations, went from place to place, ate, slept, you know, everything, just lived in that state. As I said just before, the when you're in that state, whatever rises in the mind is the radiance of the ultimate nature or of Buddha nature. And so it's always towards the good, towards joy, towards love, compassion, and contentment or evenness. So a Buddha um, to us seems to have a personality, right? Seems to be relating to us with love, compassion, and joy. And of course they are, but there's actually not a person there. There's just the Buddha nature manifesting in the world. You know, so at first we need to have a distinct time when we practice. Here it is, we're sitting down or lying down or standing or walking and we're doing the practice, right? And then we have the rest of our life where we attempt to bring that awareness into it, right? So that's while we're practicing. Once we're realized, you're able to, in that non dual state, Go to the IGA on Hyde Street there, do your shopping, chat with everybody you meet in the IGA, and that's the most social IGA I've ever been in in my life, and then it go really out, is. it really is, and then go out on the street, of course, between there and the car, 
you're going to run into people and so you talk to them as well, still in a non-dual state. But everything you say and do will be towards the good, towards joy, towards love, towards compassion, towards equanimity, you know. And so to ordinary people, they will just feel like, oh, we just had a lovely encounter with a lovely person, you know. They won't necessarily know the difference. But that person is in a non-dual state at all times. So no, so samsara is not triggering any thoughts, memories, sensations, or anything like that. Samsara is the dualistic mind. Once that's gone, samsara is gone. So that person's in a permanent state of, um, you know, abiding in their natural condition, which is a state of total and complete perfection or completeness. So yes, at yes, you'll be able to function as a normal human being, but. At first, we do need to go, oh, I need to do this in a relatively quiet environment without too many distractions. There's no way of having a perfectly quiet environment and no distractions. There is just no way. But we need to mark out half an hour, an hour or more, where we sit down, lie down, walk, stand, and do the practice. We need to mark that out. And then when we're in our lives, we can just for, for a moment, you know, regularly through the day, just touch base with your awareness and with your breathing and be there, you know, and that will elongate. So, you know, you do so that eventually it's unbroken, you know. And the final thing um, to become permeated by your, by Rigpa, by your natural awareness, is the dream state. So there are many practitioners who are like, while well, they're awake, in the non-dual state all the time, but as soon as they go to sleep, negative dreams, nightmares, boring, silly dreams, you know, the dream state is still dualistic. But then eventually that too becomes permeated by awareness and that too becomes always towards the good, always towards joy, always towards love, compassion and equanimity. So we need to... Be gentle with ourselves. Understand we've got to do stuff. In We're not monastics, number one, which means we have to live among others mostly. We have, I mean, I have a job and um, lots of people have jobs and lots of people I um, lots of people have care responsibilities. People have children, people, you know, people have friends who need us sometimes. Sometimes our friends really need our care and affection you know so yes we have to sometimes um just do our best while we're practicing but the thing is once we start to really get um deepening on the cushion then it's much easier to connect with that when we're walking around in the world and so when we're walking around the world it becomes less fraught less difficult have i asked answered your question in some way yeah, I think so. It's just the the thinking, like, um, yeah, it's when you know when you get really into something and you're really focused on on um, a project or something. Mm. Um, that that's where I tend to really lose it. <laughs> yeah, so it's not a problem. It's not a problem. I'm like so, thinking, oh, do I have to become like some, some monastic? No, it's not a problem. I'd be great if I was a monastic. I think we'd all be great if we were monastics. But it's not a problem, right? So long as we are doing our practice for a set period of time every day, then whatever happens outside of that, it's okay. It's okay. We're moving in the right direction. So really all you need to be doing is holding the five precepts, not hard to hold, as I've repeatedly said, and doing your practice every day, most days. Of course, sometimes, you know, there's disasters and we just can't because we're caring for others, um, you know, dealing with mundane stuff. Sometimes there's no choice but for a day or two to be completely involved in worldly things like that's just normal but it's not a problem so long as you are holding your precepts and doing your daily practice everything else that happens even if we're like completely losing it you know hopefully we're not but completely losing it 
the rest of the time, let's not worry about that. Let's just focus on the fact that we are holding those presets and we're doing our daily practice. That's enough. It is enough. So I'm just going to go, is that, I'm going to move on to this next question because we're only got to wind up soon. Um, so someone said in here, how to deal with issues until we're at that level of letting things come and go. That's kind of what I just was saying um, in response to Amelia's question. We just accept that's how it is while we're practicing, while we're not realized beings. We will have difficulties. We will have negative emotions. We will have trouble, frustrations, grief, loss, irritation, anger. We'll have all those things. But so long as we're holding the five precepts and we're doing our daily practice, there's no need for us to beat ourselves up, feel bad, feel we're not really practitioners, wish we could live somewhere else, more remote, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Where we are is a good enough place. Whatever our life is like is a good enough life to do the practice. So long as we're holding those five precepts and we have our daily practice, half an hour to an hour minimum, you know? So I just think, but it's really important that if we have like emotional stuff happening, you know, panic, anxiety, depression, that we do the practice that is appropriate for those sorts of states, emotional states. So the practice that is appropriate for, you know, panic, anxiety, depression is different to the practice that is appropriate when you don't have panic, anxiety, and depression, you know. So the emphasis is always on relaxation, but if you have panic, anxiety, and depression, it's almost completely about relaxation. That's your focus until you get back onto an even keel. We all experience grief, loss, anxiety, and moments of melancholia or depression. We all do. So we have to do the practice that's appropriate for where we are at that time. Generally speaking, this kind of practice is appropriate all the time because it's focused on relaxing. But you can really wind it back, right back to just corpse pose, just lying there, being relaxed. That's it. When you're feeling, you know, overwhelmed, anxious, depressed, whatever. So, yeah, so that's it. We just, so long as we're, I'm repeating this for the 55th time, so long as we're holding the precepts and we are doing our daily practice, that's enough. We don't have to worry about every single situation we're in trying to make it dharmic or better. You know, we just do our practice and not worry, not worry. Just Samsara is not perfect or ideal, bad things, irritating things, difficult things happen, you know. But we've got the five precepts, we've got our daily practice, that's enough. That is more than enough. Okay, and another question here. Um, Bhadra state. I'm not sure if you've spelled that correctly. This, okay, I'm not sure what we're talking about there. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure what that, that is about. Maybe put some more info in there. All right, uh, someone else has written, there are moments when, for example, one is in pain, like a strong headache and needs to do something that demands focus, like reading a book, and suddenly the pain disappears due to this concentration. Could we classify this as bad non-thought? No, I wouldn't say that's bad non-thought. It is a established fact that when our mind is focused, on a task or activity that is absorbing that um, negative emotions and also negative physical sensations and things, they do recede somewhat. I think the statistical, not completely, but I think someone did some research about this at a Texas hospital um, looking at um, mindfulness practice. And basically pain is reduced by about 33%, something like that, which is very significant. On average, some people more, some people less, um, when when we're mindful of what we're doing. So when we're 
you know, reading or painting or drawing or writing, something like that. So this is completely normal. Why? Because the mind can only do one thing at a time. So it, physical sensations are also thinking. That's categorized as thinking in this system. So you've got two things competing there, and so one will recede and the other will, will be dominant, and, and usually it will be like a kind of a dance. So, yeah, I wouldn't say that's bad non-thought because you are actually, if you're reading, you're thinking, and if you're painting, you're thinking, but you can go into the zone when you're doing those things and there's periods of non-thought that's recognised too. So I wouldn't say that's bad non-thought. That's just ordinary non-thought. It's not bad. All right. I think that's all for the questions in the chat. Does anyone have any other questions? No. All right, we're only one minute over our time, so we'll do the dedication. Thank you everyone for your presence. I really appreciate your presence. And then we will, I'll stop the recording now.